uh, it will be put over onto the Clark County YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, if anybody needs the site on that, I would be happy to email you the link. Uh, you should have, or Chelsea will also. Um, so you can contact either one of us, email, call. You can go on to the county site or our webpage and our numbers are there. I'll put, it, so we put the link there too. Oh, and we have a link. Oh, cool. uh, so without any further, we will have a little bit of time here. I would like to introduce to you our independent moderator for tonight, Jeff Green. He will tell you how to pull back. Yeah, well, we're going to use there are three minutes to use the yes. here. So, good evening. My name is Chuck Green. Um, my wife and I live in Ridgefield, so you are really going to have to have a good Um Actually, we have a, we have a link to that sign over there. My wife knew that Green is one of the steering team for the Green Clark Davis Food Projects. For the Green Bank project, so that's how I got to know Cheryl. Um, outside of this, uh, in 2020, my grandfather was elected to the uh, Clark County Charter Review Commission representing District 2. Um, in the last year, I served on that commission as co chair. We put seven measures on the ballot last year, uh, six of them passed. One of the measures that passed was to make the um, the Clark County Council position is not a partisan. It was passed with over two thirds support. Uh, the other other measure we passed created a fifth district. It doesn't really affect this district as much, but it affects Toronto because I'm now in the County, the New York County district that I get by where that was the capacity of more people than the non partisan effect. Uh, I'm also a member of the Clark County Commission on Aging. And so uh, I'll be aging before your eyes in moderation for this, this event tonight. Uh, also, I wanted to just kind of go over what we're going to be doing, uh, besides having a bunch of questions and answers. Uh, they, in a few minutes or a couple of minutes, I'm going to be giving each candidate three minutes to introduce themselves. We're going to have six questions. Uh, since take, uh, I think I've got approval from the two chairs to go about 12 hours. Is that right? Oh, I'm sorry, one hour. Uh, six questions. Um, each candidate will give a few minutes to answer each question. We'll rotate the order. Uh, after an hour, we'll be done. Unfortunately, with six questions, uh, probably will not have time for questions from the audience. But you won't go away empty handed because there'll be a meet and greet afterwards that you can ask all sorts of questions for these two gentlemen behind you. Um, when uh, oh, that musical company, wow, I feel like trumpets and not singing or writing. So once, um, once we got through each of the questions, uh, before we get to the three minutes, there will be two warnings that we give to each of the candidates if they're running low on time. The first warning, raise the yellow, raise the yellow warning at our release. Now, there, if there's 30 seconds, oh wait, now 30 seconds remaining, the yellow card will go out. And for those who know what soccer, you know that that's getting to be bad. And then there's the red card. There is it, thank you, Cheryl. That means I will stop and I will jump in and then uh, stop the candidate from talking and we'll move to the next candidate or the next question. Afterwards, I will turn this over to Cheryl. And she'll conclude the green the meeting and lead us to the meet goodies afterwards. So the ground rules are that we do want to hear from the candidates. Um, so we're asking you to maintain a civil decorum. And so far, I think we're doing a good job with that. So please refrain from hooting and howling, shouting and clapping out the candidate speaks um, or interrupting. Uh, Okay to laugh if they're saying they say something funny, okay to groan if it's not so funny, um, or you can feel free to laugh or talk about it. Ask candidates to observe a lot of times we talk about the cards. Uh, candidates can agree or disagree with something someone else has said, but 
I asked that each candidate please be civil. I've known each gentleman the well enough over the over time that I know that they can do that. Uh, and then once in a while, let's enjoy the time together because one of these gentlemen will be your next representative on the county council. So, without further ado, I'm going to ask the microphone when start three minutes for you to introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm Glenn Young, running for Clark County Council District 1. And first of all, I want to thank Cheryl and many other people that have dedicated a lot of time to make this event possible. It is very difficult to do so. I know firsthand it takes a lot of time, but I'm very grateful because as a candidate, one of the most difficult things to do is to reach the voters. And so when we have events like this, it's much appreciated and very helpful. Thank you for attending your favorite association meeting. I live in Vancouver, I live uh, in the downtown area in Hockey Group. I served as chair of Hockey Group for a couple of years and served in other capacities on, on our, the Hockey Group as well. And currently, I fit on the board of the Vancouver Neighborhood Alliance Committee. If you might be familiar with that group, maybe, maybe not, but it's a great group that brings neighborhood leaders together to try to solve some of the issues that they may be confronting and to develop ways of better supporting their neighborhoods. A really good program. I was very on the board of NAMI Douglas Washington, which is National Alliance for Mental Illness, where we do lots of things, pretty much everything short of treating for mental illness. So we support families that are struggling with other family members who have mental illness. We are a very good information providing tools. So the mental health institution in our, our country for that now is a bit of a mystery because we don't have to do It's really hard to look through that and figure out where to go when we need certain services. And the NAMI does a great job helping individuals find and walk their path. So I am a general contractor by trade and I for my for my Primarily in my work in my career. I've gotten into kind of an inch market recently at building the accessory development units. Many of my employers were to his brand and my second resident of your home. Prior to that, I had an 11 year career in the financial industry. And those things, as well as being a father of five. Three of which I got here, and I have my lovely wife. I'm going to shake your hand. I have an amazing team behind me at home. And the youngest two are not here today, so they're all the way from 17 down to five. So we're very busy. And um, I, it's a pleasure to be here and running because I love Clark County and I want us to build on commonality to make things better and create more opportunity and have a safe environment for our county. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you to the Truman Neighborhood Association for holding this forum. Um, I appreciate it very much. Thank you for, for attending. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to present my information and some of my, and some of my ideas before you tonight. My name is Hector Inosa, and I'm running for Clark County Council District 1. I've lived in Vancouver since 1993. I currently live in the Free Valley uh, neighborhood. My family chose to live in Vancouver instead of Hillsborough when the company I worked for uh, transferred me to the City Northwest. Very grateful that we now live in Vancouver. Uh, grateful every day for it. Uh, problem solving has become part of my DNA. I've been working since age 11, growing up on the farm. Any problem we have, we have to solve ourselves because if I just don't talk about it, we pay for our efforts to fix the problems. In my more than 40 years uh, in the semiconductor industry as a field service engineer, I've fixed equipment and processed problems worldwide. 
solving those problems or to have her to get friends. Any problems that you have that sometimes describe to me are very many times one of this facing other problems, not the ones that are described. In the many organizations I have joined, and many instances founded, they exist in our community to solve problems. The problems of the underrepresented and the neglected. The solving these problems affects all of us. I found this cozy community meal to bring community leaders and elected officials to a shared meal to discuss the problems and possible solutions in homelessness. During those early discussions eight years ago, there were many topics of conversation. One of them was a special tax to fund affordable housing. Changing land use permitting to allow ADUs to be built. And using factory modular homes, cottage neighborhoods. These things have come to pass. New ideas are still being brought up. Every last Sunday of each month at ninth at ninth and Broadway. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm going to start off with the questions. This is my first study that we got to the number of work this in the past for the one that you First question. Be elected to the Clark County Council in District 1, which encompasses primarily the city of Vancouver and its residents. What would you say to the unincorporated county residents to assure them that your decision as well on the county council would be in their best interest as well? And I'll start with them. Thank you. So, I work, as I mentioned before, everything's fine. Very rural. Uh, the nearest city is like a little bit uh, facetious. I right? grew uh, up in a city that, in a town that uh, had 724 residents. There were 18 people in my graduating class in high school. So, I know rural areas. I know about farming. I know how difficult it is to be. To be a farmer. So, in my efforts to, to build the four homes uh, for homeless and other low income residents, you know, the, the idea is that you have to allow for people to live in a safe, secure neighborhood that rural residents don't want huge developments next to them. But we still have to find housing for everyone that is moving to our county. This is a very popular county because it's beautiful. For the same reasons that I enjoy living here, other folks like to be, be here as well. So we have to be careful when we build homes to not put it in uh, farms in jeopardy, that we need to find a thing that is not arable, it is available to build safe, secure, and beautiful things. So I mean, we need to find the balance between the two building homes and preserving the beauty and the farms of this uh, county. Well, the one thing that is consistent out of my messaging is that we are all people from all different perspectives, all different walks of life. Whether you're from outside the city boundaries or inside, we're still members of Clark County. And I think it's absolutely critical that our council members represent everybody and not just those that live in their little private building. And sometimes people refer to it as that. And it might be that one of the probably the downsides of having you know, my movies are certainly really good at you know, There's always some, some side effects, if you will, of things. And that is that people tend to be focused on their own district because they move to the ones that ultimately re elect them. So, meeting people that are not worried about re election, they're worried about doing the right thing for the county, for representing everybody. Making sometimes a popular decision when it's the best thing for the county. 
Um, I'm a big believer in collaborating together, working together. But you guys are very unique in that you are the only two neighborhoods that are in District 1 that are not in the city limits. And we're so close, and yet we still have this major divide. It kind of feels like often. So I would love to work together to, again, bring people together, not focusing on our separation, but focusing on what we do to bring out these fun. And the other thing, too, is I'm, I'm a huge proponent of neighborhood. They are the backbone of our community. They really are so important, and each of you should be proud of yourselves for being here um, and being secure in your neighborhood. And I want to go, and I do go to all of our neighborhoods throughout the city. I can as many meetings as I possibly can because I don't believe that you should have to come to your elected officials. I think your elected officials should come to you. Reach out, find out how people are really feeling because as elected officials, they are very often in a time of just you know, a handful of people around them that kind of think the same way. So if we want to really be connect, connected with the community, we have to reach out to get there. So I, one of my favorite things to do is attend neighborhood association meetings. I learned so much from them. Um, some I go to more often, some are more active than others, some are really active. Everybody's kind of in their own circumstance, but I'm thinking we will definitely be very supportive of the neighborhood program in the county and improving it, making it stronger so that we can help neighborhoods be stronger. Thank you. Next question. Due to the dysfunctionality that we had in this multiple lawsuits for the last few years, of and against the Clark County Council, residents have lost confidence and trust that the council can make sound and equitable decisions for the best interest of its residents. How would you go about rebuilding that trust and showing that citizen input and matters? We'll start with Glenn and you go ahead. I think we saw this very much on display. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the county's plan for our jail. Okay. We witnessed the wrong way to handle things essentially twice in a row. You know, the first was with the process of deciding to go ahead and take control of the jail away from the sheriff's department. And I'm not going to, I don't know quite enough about that to say whether that was a good move or a bad move, but the process and how it took place was important. It did not involve public input in any form. It didn't involve any form of transparency. Something is such a big impact of decision like that, and even the sheriff himself wasn't involved, the candidates for sheriff weren't involved. Nobody knew anything. And after the council meeting where they made the approval, I did list all the testimony there to the meeting, and I also listened to the council members. I listened to the two candidates for sheriff. And I do feel that there may have been some merit to that process. Again, I'm undecided on that. But the one thing that I was supportive of was several comments for being in that meeting, and that was that we were going to move slowly. We were going to the public. It would be a long, drawn out process that would be inclusive of everyone. And then, less than a week later, we had another announcement come out that the leadership of the new jail has already been hired. And individuals have already designed their position elsewhere as the contractors are signed. And again, with zero public input, I think we have a real opportunity to change how we do things at the jail to make it more productive. We need a lot more staff, for sure. We don't get the job done. That's the most critical thing. But we have an opportunity to reshape things and redesign and gear towards improving people's lives, improving their success. So, exiting the jail and, and returning to society and their families and being successful. We have an opportunity for that. 
And I believe the collective mind of the public should be involved in that and should really direct that process. And now we've already hired the individual that's going to lead that program. Nothing against that individual person, first of all. I did not deter them with the public. And I'm adequately opposed to things like that. Things should be decided behind closed doors. They should be run to the public. And the input should have a significant impact in steering which is where the direction our policy goes. So, in regards to um, working for and contributing at the uh, kind of council, and I firmly believe, and firmly, this is the only way to approach it. Problems are not the person. There is no left or right, there's only a solution. So, when we look at a problem, we need to make sure that we are addressing the problem directly, that we're getting input from everyone. In this county, all the citizens uh, should have a voice. Uh, it could be a collective voice or it could be an individual voice, but we all have our opinions. So if we, if we weigh those opinions and those, and those solutions brought by citizens, we should listen to those. Indeed, the jail, uh, the jail decisions were definitely, I believe, mishandled. I do have some insight as to why it was made uh, as far as transferring the, uh, the, the reason for the transfer from the, from the sheriff's department to just a corrections uh, department and the jail issues is because uh, the council's uh, opinion that the sheriff was actually not doing his job and weighing not enough into the management of the jail to uh, produce the results that we were needing uh, as a county to affect a better result as people come out of the jail system, out of the justice system. So I do know that. I completely disagree with the way that uh, the person was picked to uh, take over the job, the jail, as a director. But it's not a council decision, so that the council didn't actually hire that person. It was a county manager. So that that person has the authority to hire uh, someone to run that chain. I don't believe that it, a good process was handled. The typical process is to go out and find candidates qualified and then make that decision uh, under a typical human resources decision making. So it was not followed, so that was terrible. Um, again, problems are not for us. There's, no, there's really just one solution to things, and we should take those as a very calculated effort to find the correct solution to problems. Thank you. <laughs> How do you plan to address? Let me, let me preface. I mentioned at the start that last year uh, the voters of Clark County voted to make all county elected positions not partisan. This is the first election for any of these positions that uh, as not, uh, classified as not partisan. How do you plan to address the obvious partisanship that has been shown by the county council members in the past? Are you willing to vote on issues without consideration of our affiliation? We'll start with Hector. Two part of the Problems are nonpartisan. Whether we have clean water or dirty water, it should be a fairly simple thing to approach. I believe that everyone in this room would like to drink clean water and have their children drink clean water. We should all breathe clean air. This isn't a question of being environmentalist or being a fossil fuel advocate. The fact is, we all deserve clean water, clean air, and clean food. So there's only solutions. Whether we are left or right doesn't matter. The solutions are definitely nonpartisan, and we should approach it strictly as that. 
Find the solution to a problem. And I believe that I've spent an entire lifetime finding a solution to problems. This is just another one. Uh, um, at least one part of the solution to uh, solving method finding houses for people that are on the street. We can do that for every single issue that we have in our county. So that's my opinion. We can do it in our car center. I think everybody's really sick and tired of what we see. We've seen it here locally, we've seen it nationally as well. We've seen it at the state level. I think people are tired of decision makers digging their heels in based on the ideology as opposed to what's right for the people. I think we are really hungry for people that are open to different ideas, open to the fact that perhaps they're wrong. On an issue. Perhaps they're right, but they've missed part of some really good information that can help you get there better. And I think that is it's largely missing from all of our spectrum. And it needs to go away, in my opinion. We believe we've got to start working together instead of against each other. We've got to stop. Doing this, oh, you know what? It came out of their mouth. So I'm going to close it even before I consider what they have to say. It's toxic and it needs to go away. I am a true Donald Carson candidate. I'm not supported or endorsed by either party. And I believe that's a positive because, first of all, we don't need this. Kind of territorial thing that's happening that we see on the county, it's us and them, two versus three, four versus one, or whatever. We're just people, and we should be acting as such. And we should be immediately after having a disagreement in the diets. As council members, we should be calling up those that opposed us and working on what are we going to work on together next that we agree on. So instead of focusing on our differences, working on and building on the things we have in common with each other, the things that we agree on. And I think when you build that relationship with the, with the other council members, a trust and that you're, when you do speak up, it's because you speak up about something that you believe in, something you understand or have a lot of experience in, rather than because that's what I stand for because of a letter behind the name. I think it's critical that we start to work together. I don't know how many times I can see that, but amazing how many problems you can solve when you get down to 30 and work together. Thank you. How important do you feel neighborhood associations in the county neighborhood outreach program are in general? And in particular, how can they and the county council work in conjunction to improve relationships and issues within our county? One will start with you. I've already said I'm very passionate about the office. I've spent many, 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 many hours working with neighborhoods, including my own. And as I said before, maybe it's part of the back end of the community, and they need to be stronger. We need to focus. I would love to see more resources given to our neighborhood department in the county. I would love to see more staff being dedicated. I would like to see things like, um, you know, we have the like liaison program in the county to the city. It's like we don't. So one really cool thing that the city has is that uh, you know, each neighborhood has a assigned liaison to somebody that works with the city in our case would be the county from many different departments. If you have your own assigned liaison that represents you come to your meetings, take some notes, and then responsible on those notes. I love you see something like that. You do. If you, you're for every neighborhood. Wow. 
Okay. So again, we need more support for our neighborhoods department. We really do push that. And I would love to see neighborhoods periodically come before the council and reform. That is how we have a connection. Instead of it just being kind of like this closed meeting where five county council members get together and make all these decisions, start bringing people in that are impacted through our decisions and our policy. Get them involved. And I'll tell you what, if you do that, you stop yourself from making decisions where everybody comes up afterwards with their visions, right? Literally, if you want to know what the effects of your policy are going to be, then you've got to get out there and find out what it's going to be from the people that will experience it right now. So, I'm a uh, I'm among you in the, in the opinion that indeed the county is not very well with, with cities overall, certainly even now with neighborhood associations and, and the, the problems within each of the neighborhoods. However, I mean, very slightly, it was happening in the past few weeks. I don't know if you've heard of the ECHO, Indian Community Homelessness Organization. It's a co op, it's a memorandum, um, memorandum of agreement is between the county council and the cities to help uh, address homelessness issues. So I am extremely encouraged by this, and I hope that the county will further support in working with other such organizations to address other issues besides homelessness. So if we can do that and, uh, and fully support it, uh, uh, the programs like ECHO to help solve the problems within the cities and within the county that we all share, because we all share problems. So um, we we're able to move that forward, and I certainly would support such organizations in the future. I think the only way that some of the issues is that and working on some issues. Right, thank you. Developers have a strong financial interest in one, building higher cost housing, two, expanding the urban growth boundary, and three, reducing regulations. Our residents have a strong interest in a livable, healthy community with good infrastructure or a balance of urban, rural, industrial lands. How will you listen and consider interest of our residents and developers, especially given that developers have more time and the ability to attend county meetings and notice the residents is very limited? Let's start with there. So I've, I've attended meetings, and it's a, it's a perfect example of what uh, Chuck just mentioned, where developers and uh, uh, industrial interests are well represented by engineers and consultants at the, in front of the county. They get, um, they get to do presentations, and citizens get three minutes. So I see that we need to balance that up further. We need to make sure that uh, opinions and uh, knowledge is spread across the county to all its citizens. I've seen many, many things over the past two years, actually, already the 15 years, and the uh, county decides that's the way it's going to be done because consultants have told them that's the way to do it, but it's not to the benefit of all the citizens of our county. So I, I certainly like to listen to experts, but that's also if decisions of the county affect just everyday citizens, not just developers. And so we have to make sure that we are informed and that citizens are informed. 
by the county as to what's going on and why certain decisions are made in a certain way. So my two passions, well, the two things that I'm most involved with are one, neighborhoods, and two, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a general contractor, so I'm in that industry and remember of it. And this is a this is a very challenging subject, it really is, because we all love the county or the city, or maybe we live in, as it is. And the change that we see is hard to accept on many occasions. It really is. I, I know what Kenny Cooper was when I moved here over 20 years ago. It's very different. It's changed a lot. This area is incredible. It's beautiful. We have welcoming and warm people that live here. It's a community of people want to live in. And then unfortunately, if we can meet a lot of people on the internet, you have to deal with the growth that comes in. And there's really only two ways out of it. You can create a community that's awful. People don't want to live here. Or you have to provide a place for people to live in a way that not uh, you know, it doesn't fit to exist in the area, it doesn't fit to existing green spaces, farms, and all those different things. So the, it's a very difficult challenge to balance those two things. And there does need to be a balance on it. I think the county is lacking in any kind of a, a real strong, comprehensive plan. Where is it that we want our growth to take place? Do we want it to kind of keep piecemeal like it is? I don't think that's a very efficient function. You know, let's let the community get together and decide where do we want that growth to primarily take place so that we don't keep creating these little tiny city little, you know, developments in the middle of nowhere. So there needs to be a little coherent and direct plan. And that starts with he's got the of what the community wants. What is it that we love about our county? What is it that we want to make sure that we preserve it at the same time as providing housing for so many people who want to live One of the problems that we're experiencing is the inability for many of the people who are currently here to find housing that they can afford. So we can't stop building. We can't stop providing homes for people because it's basic supply and demand. When we don't have that housing, the prices are going to continue going up to the degree that we can't live here anymore. Can't afford it. So, again, striking that power and involving public input and having a very widespread transparent process in deciding where we want that growth to take place in our county. Thank you. We, we gave you the 15 second warning that time. So, <laughs> allowing, allowing people to live on the street is inhumane. Clark County is in need of more affordable housing as well as a affordable system to assist low income residents to move into and successfully stay in housing. What are your ideas and plans to make this happen? Start with planning. So one of the things we do as a family is we, twice a week, we prepare meals for the people And they go to three different locations on Wednesday and Saturday each week and, and provide food to, to those that are in need in, in those areas. Um, and that is groups like Three Hot Soup are an, an asset to our community. They provide for the needs that aren't being provided for, for those that need that support and help. But it is kind of like the mandate. If we're going to address homelessness, we're going to have to tackle the core issues. What is causing people to be homeless in the first place? What's preventing people from exiting homeless and entering housing? We've not read enough emphasis on really actually studying what's happening. We just kind of been like robotic and just doing the same thing over and over and over again and, and thinking that it's somehow magically going to change. We've got to change directions. The city has come up with the facility committee, you probably know the city state villages, 
And I am absolutely astounded at this event that takes place today. It creates a space for individual and the complete chaos that has surrounded them for how long have they been on the street. That constant worry and anxiety, you can't leave your space because there's a very good chance that you come back and everything you own will be gone. There's the anxiety, I can't leave my space to go take a shower. I can't leave my space to go do laundry, even if I can find it to still do that. And so very quickly, you start to realize how bad the odds are against a connected homeless person. And it's a balance. Again. It's going to take accountability. It's going to take us not allowing any behavior to take place. This BOT is whatever. We're going to have to accountability. Certain things that are not going to be allowed in, in areas that we're trying to help people through their lives. We have to provide enough space for individuals to find shelter. It is absolutely inhumane to allow people to remain in the conditions that they are living in out on the street. So we have to have a really solid plan on how to get them out of there. So start with the stabilization. That is what the city has been able to achieve with the stabilization. Now people can instead of focusing on focusing on what are they eating, are they in trees? To that night, are they, you know, how do they apply for jobs? Instead of those complicated things ruling their thought pattern, now we can focus on the actual things that led up to their homelessness to begin with and help improve their lives. So, what can the county do? RCW 36.32.4 would apply. It allows, it authorizes the county to make programs and funding available for low income homeowners and development companies. It also allows the funding of people that are at risk of losing their homes, whether it's a mortgage or their rent. The county has the authorization to do that. I'm happy that ECHO is, has been has been signed. So now that the county can actually start discussions, and the hope is that the county will take the successes that we have within Vancouver, who is leading the way in trying to find shelter and homes uh, and funding for uh, homeless and very low income uh, housing to allow uh, Methods of getting folks into, into shelter, into housing, into permanent housing. So, the discussion done is earlier at some soon community meeting. From that, the Genesis came for uh, Community Roots Project, which is a nonprofit which I helped to found. And we now have got 21 homes in Free Valley neighborhood. 21 homes and housing now 35 people that were formerly on the street. We're also working on another 10 houses in the group, actually in putting it into uh, Rose Village. So if anybody wants to talk about that after this came around, I'd be happy to discuss that with you. We have a third project in uh, I'm building 18 more homes. Uh, east of the Andreessen and the south of the Fort Point. So, hopefully, by the end of 2024, we'll have at least 100 folks, more than 100 folks, housed. So, that's direct action from this is the city of Vancouver, the state, Washington State Department of Commerce, through the grants. And we hope that the county will take the most successful stories that we have, because that's not the only one. Safe State is definitely a project that has been a great success. Both of those projects help folks get help, wraparound services, so they have support and are able to succeed, get back on their feet, and back into live and productive lives. But we can't do that. Thank you. So, we're running a little ahead. 
And so um, one of the things that um, I've been bursting at it seems to ask since I'm former Clark County Transportation Manager and it was c Project Manager for the first time with uh, and Park Bridge and bike lanes and sidewalks and transit. And in, in the news now, if you were elected to the Clark County Council, what would the transportation priorities be for Clark County Council? And I'll start with Hector. So a softball question. Um, first of all, I see some things that are, that are very encouraging. So I know some folks, there's opinions versus is coming on the uh, rapid uh, okay so the best part of money stuff it's a project that is now working on the second line and I feel that, that if we promote bus ridership by actually the C train or Actually, riding the bus to and from C train order meetings, they would learn a little bit whether it's the Rubicon, what it works in the business. Right now, there's only one board member that actually directs the bus. So, if we're going to promote it, we should use it. And that's what a great way to promote it by actually being on the bus itself. So that for me is a priority. And council members, county council members, get representatives on that C track. So if I'm elected, I'm going to work with us because I'm going to see how we're going to work, how we're going to work. So that's very important for me. Um, the other thing that I see happening around the council, uh, around the county, is we're talking about us. I mean, there's a strong feelings about that. Throw in the mountain. And they lived in Europe and in the county, uh, the countries for the grand house an everyday thing. That's how you get around. Roundabouts, well, this might be the house. Uh, you can avoid congestion. You can avoid the maintenance it takes to maintain traffic signals and the coordination of traffic signals. You know how long, how many minutes an hour it takes to get from, to get all the green lights on the middle plane going to work maybe really? It'd be going 35 miles an hour to pitch all the greens. So we should coordinate that a little bit. But roundabouts, it helps me to call, get rid of those traffic lights. Smooth the traffic flow and you get the places faster. Third one. About I'm sorry. I'll try. <laughs> How many here can we have for one, two, and How many do public transportation right now? Well, thank you, anyway. <laughs> so I am a big believer in public transportation, but I'm also not a believer of forcing that on anyone before it's an efficient form of transportation. I don't think it's right. I think it's an equity issue. You know, I think that we look at it as, uh, you know, typically a way for lower income individuals to get around the city, but you're sending them you know, to a less efficient form of transportation and more consumption of their lives, the time in their life. So we've got to make an investment in public transportation, get it efficient before we go the route of forcing people in that direction. They're not kind of forcing anybody to do anything. But if you do have an alternative that works efficiently, you might choose to take it. Um, the F5 bridge, I think it's critical that we get that bridge replaced. I, I really believe that we need a third crossing. And I'm curious when it comes to 
the fact that we're in an environment where we're having to deal with somebody that thinks very differently than us on the other side of the bridge. And unfortunately, you have the landlords on the other side, and you have to have permission and approval from that another that other jurisdiction. And there is no chance of us getting a third crossing until we complete the replacement of that of the Anaheim Bridge. Once we get there, now we have some leverage. We can start talking about a third crossing. Get over. Because with electric cars coming, I think there will be probably more people on the road than less. And we've got to find that, that infrastructure so people can get back and forth. I mean, we're spending so much of our lives in our cars. Our, uh, the vehicles for me are a big the issue. They provide means for a better life in many different directions, different ways. And when you selectively and in many different ways, the government forced them out of that car if you're pushing them into a less productive means of transportation. So, again, it's like we've got it's like a chicken. Before the egg, right? You can engage which comes first. We've got to do our fair share of investment in public transit if we're going to expect people to use it. It's got to be efficient. We've got to provide ways as many as possible bike lanes, however we can get it, as long as they are respectful to the neighborhoods that they are going through. Um, Anyway, people riding in their scooters, electric unicycles, everything. So, how do we can get the most people to move the most efficient way possible? Okay, I have one more. It's not a softball question, so we'll wrap it up. So, if you're running for a position that will pay about the median income for a household in Clark County, you're going to have uh, long hours, you're going to have half the county telling you where to go, and you're going to have half the county telling you how to get there. I had heard of your wedding, please. You know. <laughs> you know, why do people vote for you? And we will start with. So, first of all, I have three of my five sitting over there. Many of you, probably most of you, had children yourself, and many of you have grandchildren. And when I moved here 20 years ago, this was a really great place to live. It was welcoming, it was affordable. I was able to buy a house on myself when I was 21 on $11 an hour, was what I was making at the time. That opportunity is not here to me. We often have neighborhoods that have quite a common thing. That is also not what we're experiencing today. We're seeing just this huge increase in crime. We're seeing affordability, affordability completely gone out of the question. If, if I didn't own my home right now, if I didn't buy it, I did, I would be able to afford that, even on my own time house day. So we have a long ways to go, long, long ways to go. And my oldest is 17, and much discussion around the how to see launch. Does he have to leave our area in order to launch? And in order to successfully move on to adulthood? Because he can't afford it here or because he doesn't feel safe. And so I am in this for my kids, for your kids, for your grandkids, to make Clark County the best place it possibly can be, as inclusive as possible, welcoming, providing. And a place where we work together to solve their solutions, solve the big problems, excuse me, to come up with a great solution. And I mean, I'm running to I, I really believe that we can do it together. I really believe that we can make a difference. We can come together with some of these really challenging issues that tend to be addressed from a polarized standpoint. I mean, how small is this? Why is it polarized? Why? You know, it doesn't need to be. And I'm just a real believer that together we can see the mountains and divide it when we fall. And I plan to bring that united. I have one of the skills that I have is the ability to work with anybody from any thought process, any background, and respect their opinion and learn from it. 
My favorite meetings to attend are the ones that I'm uncomfortable in because they have a very different thought process in mind. Because I learned the most if I just am going to meetings just filled with people with people like me, it's an echo chamber. It doesn't do me any good. All it does is encourage me to think, oh, everybody can be sitting with me. So get out know, That's what I plan to do. I'm tired of presenting one of you. And I really hope that you will consider voting for me to see if I can make an impact to get down. So I don't know. In many, in many meetings that I have attended uh, for work, um, I've got a lot of different places. And typically, when I go into a meeting, uh, after I get called after I, the assistant or a problem is he's going to be here for a couple of weeks. So I show up and I, I get an email that tells me what the problem is supposed to be. And I'm going to a meeting and I have the folks side of the table. I have the engineers on the other side of the table. And then I have the scientists at the end of the table. And then we start discussing what the problem is. And even though I know what the email told me, all these folks have different opinions. It's his fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. And I have to sort through that out and find out what the actual problem is and why they can to solve it again. And I need to keep separate. Go and talk to the actual guy that works in the system has been dealing with that problem, and I get his input, and then I start my troubleshooting. And that's one thing that's hard to teach. It's an intuition to be able to solve a problem, you have to be able to charge. You have to find out what the actual problem is to begin with it, and then chase around the system to find out what is broken, what is causing it. So that's how I reach it. When I see homelessness, I mean, the obvious thing is that people don't have houses. So then, how do you provide the houses and the support that goes with that to make sure that they're successful? and get their lives back, get back on their feet, and become successful again. Because they were successful at one time, at least the majority of these folks. They worked for a living, something happened in their lives, no matter what, they find it difficult to get back. So if we approach it from a troubleshooting standpoint, let's go find the problem, what the actual problem is, and then solve it. Now that sounds simplistic, but if we approach it correctly, we can solve problems. And that's what I would like to do. Ask for your support. And I will be happy to answer any questions you have for this part. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our forum. Please join me in thanking the two candidates for giving us their time tonight. Close the form and usually turn us back to the burden. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for those excellent questions that you remember. Also, these questions came from my neighbors. So we could have called out the ask, so I wasn't turning anybody down. Um, so, we're just a couple minutes ahead of schedule, but uh, we did have a chair. I can see us here. So, if anybody did not enter the recording, oh, sorry, we're done recording now. Not doing this anymore.